When in doubt, do it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> and in the words of Daryl Hall and John Oates, from many years ago, some things are better left unsaid. At least, only on the production side. Want to say greetings, good evening, how you doing? Welcome to Beyond Ringside Live. Beyond Ringside Sports Radio on the air, first time in a long time, on this 4th day of August 2019. In a multiple location station, yours truly hiding in the sauna. I am the Magic City Motor Mouth Fast Study Lane, being joined by tag team partner extraordinaire Mark Mabo Bowman. So, fellas, who was the dreamiest member of Three Count? You. <laughs> oh. uh, Evan Courageous. <laughs> and a. I was going to say it one way, I'm going to do it the other. Doing a hybrid, if you will, under the circumstances. My tag team partners coming on board from the Shooters Gallery on Thursday nights. We're back in, in the swing of things in the very near future. Welcoming in from the Peach State on the road, he himself, Shane Knowles. How are you guys doing? It has been forever since I've been apart with my Beyond Ringside family. Uh, we've been out of commission, but you've also been working on Thursday mm-hmm. nights. I hope that's been going smoothly. Uh, as much as possible. <laughs> and welcoming in also from the Shooters Gallery, and also first originally joined me on Back to Basics, he is the president of wrestling, hashtag trust in Phil, Phil Stamper. So as a hybrid, does that mean I'm efficient? Yes. Awesome. You get 63. Since we have representatives from all these different shows, is this a beyond ringside reunion for a rating spot? No, we don't care about the ratings. We just do this for the fun. Because God knows I don't do it for the money. <laughs> well, if this, is the, if this is the Beyond Ringside reunion, then who is it that the black people are uncomfortably looking at because they said something racist a couple of years ago? That'd be you. Well, I'm with <laughs> that sentence right there. I'm I like saying. how there was no hesitation on that be you. <laughs> yep. Lord. Yes. Well, see, the longest running gag on the Sunday edition is that Mark Mabo Bowman is actually our representative for the African American community. I really am. I have my hood card. <laughs> see, that could just be taken in so many ways. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I'm not like my grandfather who actually had a white hood card. But that's oh, God. <laughs> Me? Dude, he's been dead for almost 15 years. It's okay. It's okay. I've only been dead for five. <laughs> I've been dead inside for the past 20. Is this supposed Wait, to be cold, anything? Meanwhile, back at the ranch, let's go ahead and do this thing. Thank you to everybody listening in this afternoon through Beyond Ringside Live, ProWrestlingRadio.net. We are up and live on all fronts. Uh, 14 different ways that you can catch us live this afternoon on this fourth day of August. Um, originally had planned to go live this past Thursday night, but thanks to situations down at Studio 35, internet trouble, Skype trouble, you name it, we had it. Thursday was just a cursed day. Phil was having studio trouble, I was having studio trouble, and Mark was trying to figure out who's having less trouble. And Shane was at work, so he was doing something productive with his time. (laughs) Um, Main reason in particular is the factor, of course, us losing. The big story, of course, throughout the course of this weekend has been the fact of losing a legend, an icon, truly one of the all-time greats. Um, I There's so many accolades and so many ways, descriptors, that I could actually put on here right now, but I'm just going to simply sit back and say one of the genuine best ever in the form of one Harley race. Um Eight-time NWA world champion, nine-time champ overall, one of the most recognizable faces, names um, throughout, uh, especially the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, When I first started becoming interested in pro wrestling, Harley was the National Wrestling Alliance champion before Flair's first run. And I remember personally storylines, but I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna save mine for a little bit um later on. I would like for my contemporaries, my tag team partners, to uh offer up their thoughts and their stories in that particular regard as well. So Mabo, I will start with you. Well, see obviously I'm a lot younger than you. So <laughs> God is younger I'll... look, God is younger than me, okay? My first did you just compare yourself to God? No, I said he's younger yeah. than me. That, that is a comparison. Yeah. Merely chronological. But, 
any waffle. I my first real like exposure to Harley Race was you know I'd missed the the NWA years, and I I got him when he was brought in as as and, and declared king in the WWF. I guess technically he was the first you know before Lawler showed up in WWF, obviously first king of the uh, ring winner. No, he wasn't the first king of the ring. Actually, according to him, he they was. Just, they declared him king. But that's when I was first exposed to him, and I wasn't really sure because, you know, once again, being a kid of the 80s and, you know, seeing guys like Hogan and, and Macho and all these guys, I'm like, you know, he wasn't, he still had that 70s body and stuff. And I'm like, who's this? And it didn't do him any good dyeing his hair, that blondish color. It made him look way older than what he was. He had that tight perm. So I'm like, who's this pasty, doughy, white dude? Like, it didn't really make any sense to who he was because, you know, this was pre-internet. Hmm. You know, I, I, and the libraries didn't have, you know, obviously the library wasn't going to have anything on him. So I wasn't really sure who he was. I mean, I knew he was from an older generation because, you know, I came in at the end of, of Bruno's career and Pedro Morales' career. And so, you know, I was, obviously I knew he was from that era, but I really didn't, you know, wasn't aware of the heyday that, that he had. And, you know, it wasn't until much later when he had pretty much gone into retirement, but he was managing the likes of, like, Vader and Luger and all that in WCW when I was like, oh, this guy's a legit badass. And, you know, and of course, finally, when you get stuff like, you know, the internet with YouTube and all this other stuff, you can go and you have more access, you know, as, as we progress, you have more and more access. And, you know, this dude was, you know, this guy was legit. You know, it's probably one of the toughest men to come through professional wrestling. And so, like I said, my exposure to him was, you know, just this dude that they made King and he was, you know, part of the Heenan family. And I was like, okay, well, it doesn't really make any sense, but whatever. So, you know, that was my first real exposure to him. But, you know, thankfully, through the progression of technology, I've been able to go back and be like, oh, this guy was legit, you know, and definitely give the respect, you know, that that he deserves. And what I enjoy, you know, of course, pretty much anybody from, you know, the, the previous eras of wrestling was the, was the road stories. And then what eventually became the cookout stories that, that everyone <laughs> has uh, of hanging out with Harley Race. And, you know, definitely... With the loss of Harley Race, we, our only hope of ever stopping the Grim Reaper lies in Haku. I saw that post. Phil Stamper, come on board. What'd you leave me with? I, <laughs> um, I mean, Harley Race was definitely a legend. I mean, same thing, you know, his heyday was before I got into wrestling. At the same time, I knew right away who Harley Race was. He had... Um, a presence. Everyone talked very highly of him. Very, and even more recently, um, with with WLW that he was running, that he made, he was making superstars. Still, he was running camps. Still, um, and even not too long ago, I knew people who were going to those camps. Um, I don't know if you guys saw today as well that, you know, Trevor Murdoch made a comment yeah. about. Uh, the benefit of 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 his of what he brought into wrestling and that uh as he as his health was taking that final turn he needed to go from atlanta to st louis for medical shape medicare wouldn't help him so the wwe stepped in and paid for the transportation in full yep so you know it it speaks to the caliber of legend that he is very true shane knowles come on board when i think of harley race i think of a true man among men uh in my life i've always placed harley race in kind of an unofficial foursome along with dick murdoch dick slater and terry funk and harley race four guys who maybe didn't look cosmetically like any professional wrestlers you would see from 1984 going forward but guys that could go in the ring, good promos, knew how to sail, and knew how to make opponents. 
uh, certainly as I've gotten older, I look at the craft, the way Harley would make the local baby face. Everywhere he went from Mexico, Japan, New Zealand, throughout the continental United States, I think, you know, he gave to a fault. Uh, I mean, if you listen to anybody talk from that era, he made Don Morocco down in Florida in the 70s by giving Don all this offense and coming within a hair's inch of beating him and leaving that entire territory thinking our guy Morocco is going to be world champion. And that's what Ric Flair tried to emulate. He said he studied hard about how you help make people and give and give and give and I'm not so sure from that time period, like, say, 1976 to about 1982, if Harley Race wasn't about the best wrestler in the world. He was certainly, I think, among the most traveled uh, NWA world champions. I I can't think of anywhere he didn't go. Um, And you think about the high running knee, you think of the pile driver, you think of the diving headbutt that you see guys like Dynamite Kid, Chris Benoit, and certainly Triple H on the running knee emulate. Yep. Uh, I especially love that bump he would take, an Irish whip out of the corner with a guy reversed him, and just looked like with no regard to his body back over the top rope. I mean, certainly Triple H has emulated that as well. Um, I think Harley Race is a product of an era that we just don't see anymore. I mean, not just because of the perm or his cause. I mean, this is a guy who admittedly drank a 12-pack or a case of beer and would smoke a pack of marble red. I and mean, all he had to do was hear him in a promo to know that was true. Yeah, he wasn't all about protein shakes and clanging weights and all this stuff. But the guy could go out there and work an hour every night and make it entertaining. And imagine today if a guy told you he's drinking a case of beer or a fifth of Patron and smoking, you know, a pack of Camels before he goes out there. Vince McMahon's not going to have that guy on the roster. I don't think AEW is going to have that guy. But he could go, and that's all that mattered. And Hardy Race was believable. I mean, I, <laughs> promos, in-ring work, I never thought there was anything phony about Harley Race. And uh, much like Mabo, I think a lot of people that I know only got their exposure to Harley once he came over to the World Wrestling Federation in his mid-40s and was made king. And, you know, to, you know, Harley at that point was still working. They had the bad injury with Hulk Hogan. Uh, with the table spot, but I think a lot of people at that time thought, what's all the fuss about with this guy? Because you would heard about him throughout the NWA, you're like, okay, now he's coming into New York, so to speak. I just don't get it. But as Mabo said, you go back with now with technology and you watch some Harley Race stuff. Um, things that stand out to me was Harley was always for the boys. Uh, he was someone who would stand up to crooked promoters about payoffs, not just his own, but anyone else on the card. And uh, what a, as tough as nails as he was in the squared circle, how nice of a man he was out of it. As Phil said, his training schools uh, all the way up until at least almost uh, 75 and a half years old, still being active with running his, his promotion out in the Midwest, St. Louis, Kansas City area. Um, I mean, certainly the stories in people's books like Nick Foley just speak so beautifully of him. But, uh, guys like Mr. Hughes, uh, Big Van Vader, Lex Luger, they said Harley was so instrumental in their careers, teaching them how to work, how to make a presence, how you walk out the curtain, how to how you come across as legit in a main event. Or so, uh, I know I'm getting long winded here. But You're fine. Harley Race is someone that I think um, I, I'm glad to see him getting his just due. I, I'm really glad. My, my last thought on this is to see wrestling being covered now more so by publications like Sports Illustrated, ESPN, whatnot. Each of them had articles. Uh, with quotes from Terry Funk, Jim Ross, and Ric Flair. And, you know, that's something that maybe eight, ten years ago, if Harley had passed, I don't think he would have gotten that mainstream coverage. So I'm glad to see people are getting an opportunity to hear about who he was. I join you in that one because when Race was world champion, through the out nine different world championships, eight with the NWA, professional wrestling wasn't looked at in the same light as it is in, per se, the last ten years with the Attitude Era and the Monday Night Wars and everything coming into play that was garnering mainstream attention over the last few years. Um, And that's the sad part about it because, you know, I will agree with a lot of those who came before me and those who stand with me chronologically speaking. You know, you may not believe that the people who were in this industry in the 50s, 60s, and 70s 
were extraordinarily athletic, but they were damn sure athletes. And, you know, Shane said it perfectly a second ago when you talk about the fact that Harley would kill a 12 pack in a, car, in a pack of Marlboro Reds. You know, I think we all, I think uh, three of us know of somebody else in particular who doesn't mind taking a smoke break during a show. And I'm not talking about me, am I? No, I'm not. For a change. Um, and so I will challenge that Haku statement with Bob Armstrong. <laughs> Still very much with us, thank God. Um, and thanking heavens for each and every day, too. You know, with me at 53 and coming into the infancy of cable with the basic channels that were coming in, WTCG before it was TBS, WWOR9 out of New York, which was running Saturday Night World Wrestling Federation, WG in Chicago wasn't even touching wrestling. Um... ESPN eventually would pick up Global Wrestling Federation, world class, not necessarily in that order. But then you had syndicated television that would pick up. Like in Birmingham, we would get both, and I'm going back years for this, the NWA Nick Goulas promotion out of Chattanooga, as well as Southeastern Championship Wrestling owned by the Fuller, Golden, and Welch families. And to be able to see, and this is where I consider myself a very fortunate individual, to have seen as they transpired storylines between Harley Race and Dusty or Harley Race and Mr. Wrestling 2, um, Tommy Wildfire Rich, Ric Flair, Rick Steamboat. I mean, I wish I could have seen more of the Harley Race Jack Briscoe timeline or Harley and Dory or Terry as that matter of fact comes into play. But you see about where I started coming into pro wrestling as far as the viewer goes. Um, Wasn't Harley Race the one who ended Dory Funk's long uh, title ring? I think so. I don't, I, I don't have that directly stored in the front part of my brain, so I'm going to have to say I think so. But, but as soon as you brought that up, I mean, Harley Race was the one who dropped it to Tommy Rich in August. Maybe that, that just dawned on me. Okay? And that's going to lead me to another one. And Mabo, just close your ears for a hot second. Because years ago, or a few years ago, Harley was a very special guest on Wrestle Rage Radio right here on Beyond Ringside's radio uh-huh. network. And Corey Nichampkin and Stan Grubb um, set up the interview with Harley. I was lucky enough to be a part of it. And for those of you that have heard the Harley Race uh, locked-in promo that, I, that we call it, um, that was the origin of that promo. Um, Mr. Race was extraordinarily generous with his time. And once we, I mean, from the time that he got on the phone to the time that he hung up, he was one of the most gracious individuals. Did not know us from Adam and was extraordinarily generous and genuine. Um, didn't run anybody down, didn't slam a generation or a, de- a decade or da 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 he, he didn't do the negativity. And if you only know the public persona, the heel Harley race, you would think he is the most gruff a-hole ever. And then, once again, that interview occurred, which I want to thank Corey for posting the link to that interview On my personal page, I've been meaning to share it, and I apologize for not doing so, but for those who have me on uh, Facebook, and I'll turn around and share it through the Beyond Ringside network of um, pages in the next little while, um, probably a little bit later this evening. But that interview was a dream list item for me, and I was extraordinarily grateful to be a part of it. And I still actually, once again, once I saw the link was up, it's like I went back and listened. And I would wish that I had, because... My three partners on this show know the fact that I have two versions of the show. I have the as aired version that you hear on the podcast feeds that you also hear on the lot as it's being performed live right now. And I also have the production side audio. (laughs) And why? Just why? Why what? No, just keep going. Yeah, I'm gonna shortly before I bite the bullet and um, shed this mortal coil. S H E D. This mortal coil. 
Um, I'm going to release all the production side audio. So if there's anybody you want to apologize to, do it now. <laughs> no, actually, you got I'm some. cool. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I know. I play the soundbite of you and Ted Guinness every once in a while anyway. <laughs> Hey, go ahead. I, I want you to do it now. Do it now. I'm not Release the film now. <laughs> Release the film now? No, I'm not releasing yeah, I don't give a. I don't give a damn. No, Madam Speaker, I will not release those reports. I don't care what you say. Um, <clears throat> But coming back to reality for a hot minute, in all sincerity, um, I join, and actually those of us here, not only with the Beyond Ringside family of shows, but of course... Um, on a personal level, the Beyond Ringside family, um, a number of us have had conversations over the last few days, whether it was um, Evil, Adam Smith, um, uh, the understudy, Rogers Alley, Andy Hudson, and a number of us um, have had different things to say about this. And our entire radio family, current and a number of the previous, would like to offer up our humblest condolences to the family, to the friends, and the inner circle of Mr. Race. And we hope that you can find some peace as well as remember that time. I mean, I know it's hard to say, and I'm the one who says it about my own mortality. Life is meant to be celebrated. Once this ends, we just move the party to a new place. And y'all got to catch up with us when we get there. <laughs> or when you get there. You got some making up to do. But in all sincerity, once again, our humblest condolences to the family of Harley Race. A tremendous individual, a true legend in every sense of the word. Moving to a contemporary realm. I've been doing some thinking over the last few days. Oh, uh, damn. <laughs> and everybody panics at once. Shane's driving in his car. Cool. <laughs> Shane's, I <yeah>, know. <laughs> It's like, okay, hold the wheel, hold the wheel, hold the wheel. No, nope, don't run off the tracks yet. Um, in all sincerity, we've seen press releases about new additions to AEW, All Elite. One of who is a good friend of ours here on the Sunday edition of Beyond Ringside. And I'm referring to former director of fun, former um, head official for Chikara, um, very recognizable name and face in pro wrestling, Bryce Remsburg. And actually, Mabo, you know Bryce better than I do, but um, you've had more chances to talk to him than I have. Of course, we've had him on the show a number of times. Very gracious with his time. And by the way, congratulations, Bryce, on the contract. Dude, happy for you. <laughs> Knock a home run again. Um, with the names that are being signed to multi-year deals with AEW, do you genuinely and this is not a direct reflection on any one person who has been signed in recent days or yet period but are you becoming more and more optimistic about the series premiere on tnt in october yes or no maybo well the fact that it sold out in under two hours has got to mean something you know but are you personally excited I mean, I'm as excited as, I don't know, I've just become very jaded over the years. Eddie, hit mm -hmm. him with a line. No, nah, keep going. But, I, I, like I said, I've just become jaded over the, the whole, everything. But I'm, I'm definitely excited because hopefully this will maybe, maybe spark a fire under other companies to rethink what they're doing. I don't know. Um... I'm also excited to get to see people that, you know, unless you have a subscription to certain streaming services, you might not get to see regularly. Uh, I'm I'm happy and excited to see that. I mean, I'll just go ahead and throw it out there. You know, people have their, you know, opinions on it. But personally, I'm a huge MJF. You know, I'm a huge MJF fan. And to get to him, see him to be able to do it on a much larger platform, I'm happy for that. Um. So yeah, I'm I'm excited, and you know, once again, it's not going to be just like, well, let's base everything off of what happens on one episode. You know, there's definitely going to be some growing pains. At least they're you know they're not doing it from the middle of a mall with with pasta with pasta mania in the background. 
So, you know, there's definitely going to be some growing pains. I mean, they're still, they're still having issues with their, I guess, you know, free streaming type larger events and even with the the ones that you have to pay for. So, you know, like, with, with at least with the WWF, when they first started, they they had the opportunity, you know, a couple of years to grow before they moved into what would eventually become pay-per-views. And they could work on that. You know, they had television under their belt and all this, that, and the other. So, you know, there's definitely going to be some, some rocky starts, and maybe it's a little bit of that NASCAR, you know, 10-car pileup mentality that maybe I'll want to watch to see, you know, what's going to happen. But, I, I mean, I'm excited. I'm just excited that there's once again going to be an attempt to make a second because I'm not really going to count New Japan God knows I, I like what's going on over there I like you know what they're doing but they're never going to be as big as they should be in the United States right so as far as a second you know larger promotion uber promotion you know to make an attempt to grow in in the in the you know North America yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely interested to see what's what's going on. Philip, I am very mixed. I mean, we've we've talked before on air about how you know when it comes to wrestling, I believe nothing until it happens, and even then, I, I'm suspect. Um, oh. Watching their live events so far, I have not been overjoyed. Um, and, you know, this is a company that, you know, Cody Rhodes came out at first and said, we're not having any writers, which we all were like, well, that can't happen because you have to have some semblance of order on, on an event where you have matches in a particular time frame that, you know, you're going to have some kind of order to the chaos. And then, you know, Joey Janela still goes over on his matches. Um, ah! <laughs> then S- saw that coming. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm sorry, but it, it's the, it's reality. And when I saw he not still this owes past, you- <laughs> I'm sorry, he still owes you money, doesn't he? <laughs> No, he never owed me money. Oh, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I'm I'm new to this. Let's let's let's, uh, let's take away at this Janella scab real quick. No, I I I was just pointing him out. I did not mean to start a Joey Janella conversation. Um, <laughs> but with AEW, when I watched two events ago, watching it, I'm like, oh, this feels very much like 2001 WCW both on production side and the way some of the talent was working. And then my brain went, that's not all bad. And that's not all good. Um, you know, they've, they're upping their production, which is great. Um, but there's just weird stuff in, in some of their in ring presentation that I'm, I just don't know where it's settling. And they had, even though the entire event was free when they had their pre show that was being aired as free, um, it was like they had a tag match that started great and then like oddly went kind of derailed and, but not like in a bad way. It just like, it was like all of a sudden they stopped all action and was like, rest hold. <laughs> okay. Now it's SoCal Uncensored's mo- time. It's like, maybe they were going too short on time and needed to stretch it out. Th- then, you know, I feel bad that the women's match just didn't click because I, I love both of those women. I think they're awesome competitors, but it just didn't, for whatever reason, it just didn't click. And then you had the CEO guy. And, like, I'm sorry. That just didn't, like, this is the match you want to, like, hey, guys, look what we're going to do when you know on your main event you're going to have a hardcore match. And you're going to do crazier stuff, but you're like, this is the teaser? It's like, it, it just came off so bad. And then, like, I never felt the event itself really got off the ground in some respects. Um, Not all the matches were bad. Not all the moments were bad, but it was just weird. It felt like just some parts weren't quite clicking until you got to like the main, you know, the, the top two matches on the car. Um, And that's how it keeps feeling. Anything that has the, the bucks, Kenny Omega and Cody Rhodes is a very different feel and vibe and caliber than the rest of the card. And that's not saying the rest of the card can't get there, but they're not there yet. So you're trying to portray, and of course, Dean Ambrose, or uh, uh, John Moxley. Jericho. Um, Jericho. And, and 
Well, Jericho wasn't wrestling on those last two shows. I don't true, think was he? True. No. Okay. No, he was. So, it, it it yeah. I don't. So it just felt weird. It felt weird. And of course, when when he's on, he's going to be great. But it's like, what is going on? And I don't know. I really want them to have success, but right now, like. They're not at a level where they're going to compete with the WWE, though there's sort of this interest and vibe on them doing that. So, of course, they're going to get a lot of presence, a lot of buzz. They're going to be on TNT, which already has more viewers than wherever Impact and Ring of Honor is on this week. Um, They're going to have a stronger presence, which means they're going to last longer. I want them to succeed, of course, but I feel like they have some more writing of the ship that they need to do. Shane, your thoughts? Well, I feel like I've been AEW's biggest fan since I brought this up on Beyond Ringside back in, I believe, October of last year about the possibility of buzzing that we heard about this new upstart promotion. Could it happen in January 1st? We didn't feel you. Uh, to Phil's point, that's exactly a sentiment I've shared. And it probably shouldn't come as a surprise, but when, you, when I see Jericho, John Moxley, Cody Rhodes, and Dustin Rhodes, it is glaringly apparent you can tell who has worked the show, so to speak, with WWE, who has been under contract, who's worked those pay-per-views, done that road schedule, working a hard camp, presentation, everything. I mean, Young Bucks and Kenny Omega have not done WWE, certainly have been involved in high-profile matches in Japan. But, um, when Phil said that, it really struck me. That's the way I felt on these first three shows, as you can really tell who's been something. Uh, but obviously AEW is now a company for a lot of those guys to get a chance to say they've been somewhere. Uh, so many people are high on MJF. Uh, count me in Did on that. It. He's a throwback deal. Uh, I think all out, I mean, to me, I looked at it that double or nothing was sort of like one of your big four, a Rumble, SummerSlam, Mania, Survivor Series, the Fight for the Fallen, uh, and Fighter Fest. Those were like in your house pay-per-views, and now all out. It's going to be another one of the big four, so to speak. We're comparing it to WWE, and I think a lot of that has to do with the ones that Jericho appears on. <laughs> I mean, not, it's not just about him, but he, uh, excuse me, in wrestling, I know he appeared on Fight and Fall. But I think it all out, Chicago is one of the best wrestling crowds in the world. And I, I can only speak to people that are in my inner circle at work or friends that I see online. So many people heard about Double or Nothing. Wow, the Cody Dustin match, or the Lucha Brothers, and the and, and the um, excuse me, the Young Bucks, and then Omega and Jericho. They wondered what the fuss was about. Some have tuned in to the free uh, Bleacher Report shows, the Fighter Fest fight for the fall. It weren't blown away, kind of, sort of, yeah. I think All Out though has that opportunity with that Chicago crowd. I mean, obviously, I told Eddie this last night when we were discussing this over a smoke spoiler alert, kids. Um, you know. <laughs> the Lucha Brothers and the Young Bucks have a ladder match. There's no tag team titles yet. There's nothing to fight for. They just pretty much know that those two have tremendous chemistry together. It's going to be that good. Let's just throw a ladder in it for elements to play. Um, I am a huge fan. This is something we go down to on the other side. Sean Spears being guided by Tully Blanchard versus Cody Rhodes. Um, certainly Moxley Omega, I think, for your hardcores. But I think the pressure is on Hangman Adam Page. Win or lose. This is a guy that obviously you can see they've got the rocket up his tail from day one. If you can't have a good match with Jericho in the main event, does the bloom come off the rose fairly or unfairly? Because sometimes with a pro wrestling audience, you're going to get that one chance. And I think it makes a whole lot of sense to me to have Jericho as your inaugural champion going into TNT. Mm -hmm. I know that may upset a lot of people in the internet wrestling community. Well, you said it's about making new people, and it will be. You tell me when you're starting a national product on TNT, who do you want with that big gold belt around the waist? Chris Jericho, a marketable household name, or Hangman Adam Page, who you have? I think he can still gain a lot, even in defeat, in that main event. As far as Punk, I mean, Chicago, he's doing StarCast. I remember telling you this yesterday. If Punk is going to be there, I would have him come out on the ramp, stand, and look at the people for the holy you-know-what chant, and then just go away. And everyone could complain that he didn't touch anybody, he didn't talk, what was that all about? If you start off your inaugural show with CM Punk with a live mic will be in the ring, that's called eyeballs glued to television sets. I think it's a great way to get them in. 
But even with or without Punk, I think coming off all out, if that Chicago crowd reacts like the Double or Nothing crowd did out in Vegas, mm-hmm. and it delivers, and I say it, no pay per view, I think delivers from start to finish. But you know, truly that Double or Nothing, those final three matches with the Rhodes, the Young Bucks, and then Omega Jericho really had you going. But it's the rest of that card, the women's division, MJF, you know. Uh, the librarians, I mean, that's the only thing that makes me slap my forehead is I get it, we've got to have a little bit of comedy, but it needs to be funny if it's going to be comedy. Um, as far as production, I'm with Bill on that, that fight for the fall, and that was my first thought. My gosh, this looks like the WCW outdoor pay-per-view or a Monday Night Nitro Spring Break edition, which, I mean, WWE, if it's not a mania, just about every week on Raw and SmackDown, no matter if you're in Portland, Oregon, or Portland, Maine, it looks the same on television. So it's kind of been refreshing to see the venues look a little different. I think they'll up the ante on production side. Tony Khan certainly got some cash. And one thing I like about it, I think this differentiates some people have asked is what do you think the difference is between this and TNA? TNA, it's not like you're trying to sell it to some business sponsors who really don't have a clue. That's an investment. Tony Khan's a lifelong fan. And I think that's going to give them a much longer leash if things go in the red, so to speak, as opposed to, ah, this is another business venture like a restaurant that didn't work, pull the plug. Tony Khan's a frustrated, jaded wrestling fan who wants an alternative. And that is my hope, alternative, that AEW can be that alternative for the jaded fan, who maybe it began in March of 2001 when WWE ceased to exist, or has come along in the last three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years with WWE. See, the number one problem, and you, um, all three of y'all kind of touched on it, and uh, Shane, you really hit on it a second ago, the production value from WWE, it has become cookie cutter. Legit. It doesn't matter if it's the pre-show panel or what used to be the post-show. Hell, the post-show was more, in, more entertaining than some of the matches on a WWE pay-per-view. The lighting's always the same. The staging's always the same on Monday Nitro. I mean, it's like, okay, every once in a while, change things up. Got that. But um, I'm going to checklist a couple of things. Number one, Adam Page. I agree wholeheartedly should not be the champion coming out of All Out. The chase is what will make Adam Page that much more of a viable commodity to AEW. He is a damn good in-ring talent. I've watched him in person. I've, I mean, I've known him for a while. Um, watched him on a number of different outings, everything from New Japan to Ring of Honor. You name it, all of the above. And he still has some growing to do as far as his uh, visibility. Um, from there, MJF. Oh, boy. I saw the picture of him and Jericho face-to-face earlier this week. And if that's not a clash of generations, I don't know what the hell is. Because I like MJF. This kid has got talent. He's got charisma. He has got the attitude to be a pure heel. But guess what? Pure heels don't sell t-shirts. But in 2019, they do. (laughs) Buy the t-shirts if you want to. I'm still better than you, and you know it. Um, I really, I'm, I remember, I think, I'm, I've worked with him. On, I've been on. I've been with him on two different shows. Um, one, of course, was PWX out of North Carolina. One was down in Georgia, and no, Tennessee. Sorry about that. And just the kid commands a room, and he is a behind the microphone in his walk, in his talk, all of the above. Um, he is a throwback heel, and I think that's something that is sorely missing in this era because yeah i know okay i can sound dated if i want to i can and a lot of people are going to say that i do but the fact of the matter stands do you want to be a real heel that can make money off your talent or do you want to be the cool heel that's going to make a couple extra bucks selling a couple t-shirts here and there a true heel can write their own check plain and simple um, my level shifting gears, my level of optimism toward AEW does continue to grow. Looking forward to once again, 
we get to opening day of the season. Once again, we've seen pay-per-views. That's cool. That's great. That's wonderful. Those are what I call spot shows. And they're doing a little bit on each one to continue to build viable storylines for the company. Needed. Definite necessity. As we get closer to opening day in October, I look for a lot more things to occur. I, I agree with Shane. I love the concept of Sean Spears being managed by Tully Blanchard. And for those who want the throwback, I brought this one up last night when Shane and I were having the discussion before the PWA live event in Carrollton. Or excuse me, Villa Rica. And flashback. I made the reference that I would love to see Rhodes managed by Arn. And lo and behold, why not have that moment build to where Arn turns on Rhodes and rejoins Tully side by side and throw up that four? The biggest nemesis any Rhodes has ever had in their life has been named Anderson or Blanchard. Guess what? Now you got us both. You know, something of that ilk. That's something that's going to draw in that 40-plus jaded wrestling fan. You got Rhodes and Arn. You got um, Blanchard and Anderson on. Uh, uh, okay, hold on. DVR set now. Where can I see the pirate? Where can I see the old episodes? <laughs> There's not that many. Shut up. But it's it's a building process, and this is something that I can. T- we have said this on this show numerous occasions. You have to give it time. WWE's been around for how many freaking years? through how many different talents go ahead i'm raising my hand over in the corner this is uh the only thing i wanted to throw out when i knew we were doing the show this evening it seems like a perfect time to drop it for all three of you i have this question aew starts weekly october 2nd let's look into the future to march of 2020 six months down the road aew's weekly wednesday night television program will be trending or will be successful in six months if they do what, and it will not be successful if they do what. I'll start with Maybo. Hmm. Will be successful um, if they distinguish their product from what the WWE puts out. You got to find that, that 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 niche that definitely separates them, kind of like what TNA did with their knockouts and their impact or their uh, X division. Don't know what it could be, but they're going to have to find that that you know. So people don't look at oh well, this is this is like WWE just with people I've never heard of, <laughs> and to not be successful would be to eventually fall into trying to emulate what the WWE does or go to the left to so far, like so far out there that people look at this and go, what is this? And they don't get it. I mean, you want to have something that sets you apart from the WWE, but you don't want to go so far away from the core of what you're trying to get across that people shy away from it. And also don't fall into the trappings that TNA slash impact did and sign and start signing every WWE cast off just to get, you know, that, that, that name recognition short pop. Yeah, don't, you know, I mean, you know, believe the rumors, don't believe the rumors, but, you know, say the, say the revival, say they do get released or they choose not to sign or what have you. Yeah, that would be a good sign because to me, they, I could see them adding value, not, I mean, because are they a name value? Mm, Yeah. But are they a work rate value? Yes. To me, I mean, like I said, that's my my opinion. Yes, the the inner 
the 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 Uber fan wants to see Revival Bucks or maybe even Revival Dustin and Cody. But you know, and that was, and that's great and all, but as far as saying I know it would never happen but signing Roman Reigns that would be more of a to me that's more of a name value signing than a a work rate signing but that's just like I said that's just my opinion everybody has their opinion on whose name and whose work rate is different and just be careful about who you're throwing contra- contracts out to yeah you might like the you know the kid and this this you know, regional independent, but is he really going to bring something to your company? So watch who you sign. Bill Stanford, in six months, you think AEW will be successful with their weekly show if they do what? And it will not be going trending successful if they do. On the, on the downfall side, they're not going to be successful if they go the route of a WCW. We're booking all our boys. We're booking all our friends. We are putting on a show to pop ourselves, forgetting that there's a crowd um, that we need to cater. I mean, one of their whole things is that we're catering this to you, the fans, and we're giving you something else that the WWE isn't giving you, the fans. And and sometimes it feels a little like we're doing service to ourselves, the talent who have been so misrepresented um, and not getting the opportunities we need. And it it's funny. So I... I I will not mention the name, but on another podcast had a conversation about how, uh, you know, the, the, this last pay-per-view, the young bucks, um, faced off against other members of the elite. And it was like, Oh, so finally one of them is going to lose. Because if you look back, I think other than Omega, Cody, Cody hasn't lost. The young bucks hadn't lost. And so it's like, well, wait a wait a minute, like, what are you trying to say? Like, what are you trying to build? If you're trying to say, like, hey, Ray Phoenix and Pentagon Jr. that have a great appeal, but, okay, a mainstream audience doesn't know them yet. Well, Young Bucks, you know, mainstream audiences don't necessarily know you too, but you're the better or the higher level known talent. Well, wait a minute. Why aren't you giving them that opportunity to step up? So it's a little bit like, what are they doing to build up their product and and the talent they are in? And I... I want to see more of that because I'm not getting more of that yet. Um, I don't want them to go the route of WCW. I, you know, I'm glad that Tony Khan made the, made his statement very early on that, you know, yes, I'm a big wrestling fan, but I'm not stupid. I'm a businessman. I'm watching where my money is going. And part of me is like, I really hope that's true and that he really is watching where his money is going and that he's paying attention to how it's used, what they're going to do with it. Um, that he has a little bit of the business sense that he's helping to provide. It's it's very interesting because you know I have I have my own thoughts about some other companies that are too much focused on. I mean, and WWE being the lead example, we're too much focused on being a television product and not a wrestling product. But part of me is also a little worried that they're gonna f- that AEW is gonna focus on being this niche wrestling product without a without recognizing they're on television and and there are differences in that. And how that portrays. So I want to see them step it up. And like, and like, I think we've heard all all of us say now, how are they making themselves different without alienating fans? How are they getting themselves out there? And in a, this weird way, I feel like TNT is is latching on because it's because it's Cody Rhodes, and they had a great relationship with his father. It's not Dust Dusty anymore. It's Cody, and is. And I'm not, that's not a bad thing. That's not a smacking thing. That's not any disregard, but it's like, are they going to be able to deliver? And I think that's the question. They have to be able to deliver, or in a year we're going to be talking about... Them moving to Twitch. <laughs> right, right. That, they're being bought out, they're giving up, something else has happened. Like, I, and, but, and, and all of this is fun. Like We want to see it succeed. We want to see it be awesome. Because we know that there's this interesting, very interesting potential, but it's like they have to sort of watch, watch some of the steps they're taking. Eddie, I'll let you take the final on this one. I'll say mine real quick. I think they'll be successful if they don't give away too much too soon. I 
don't think they have a Hogan Goldberg match on their roster at the moment. Something near that, I wouldn't give it away early. Um, I would like to see AEW do something akin to the old WWF and NWA in this regard. I don't think there's any more jobbers in the world of wrestling. But you can bring in guys, local talent from any state, and they don't have to be treated like jobbers. They could give a good competitive match. We could all name probably a dozen to 15 guys off the top of our heads who were not signed with any major promotion that could do a weekly spot and do a good 8 to 10, heck, 12 to 15 if you needed it. You accomplish one, a lot of things. Your stars go over. Your stars look good. The guy they went over also looks good. So when he goes back to his regional, local, grassroots, independent company, he can say, hey, I worked with Moxley for 14 minutes, blah, 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 blah. And maybe the locals will see him as something bigger than he is already in his own territory. Uh, so I just wouldn't give away too much main event stuff early. Um, and one reason, too, I think we all complain with WWE. I can remember the pay-per-views of four throughout the 80s and 90s, and early 2000s, like gangbusters. Seemingly, there's one every three weeks now. There's no proper build. So if you used that, then I think their big four that they talked about would certainly stand out more without giving away too much too soon. Um, I'm like, Phil, I think it won't be successful in six months if they're not able to carve out something besides that niche audience. We've already seen with Double or Nothing fight for the fallen and now the first television uh, tv taping in dc they're going to sell out to an audience of guys that i think between the ages of say 18 and 38 maybe 42 years old it's just a ballpark figure on that but can you expand to where i think all of us probably you know had memories as a child of doing the macho man elbow off the couch onto our friends, or we did a Hogan leg drop off the diving board in the pool. Can you make it cool where I see little kids wanting to dress as the young bucks for Halloween or young children when they're practicing their wrestling maneuvers they shouldn't be doing or hitting Kenny Omega V triggers on one another? Can you make wrestling cool to that audience without losing the, hey, we're an alternative, we're a different niche from what WWE is doing with their corporate machine shoving it down our heads? Can you find that right balance? One, always leave them wanting more. It is the psychology of entertainment. When you are trying to put together weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, episodic shows, give them enough to where they sit back and say, I want more. I want this again. I want the rematch. I want to see this triple threat when this other person comes in. There is a psychology to booking live events and television. WWE is writing television. I, Phil and I have had that agreement in place for a long time. And... The fact of the matter stands, if you're booking a live pro wrestling show on television, there is a smart way to do it. Now, injuries happen. That's why to continue to build your future today. You have to invest in talents and bring them along to get them to that top tier. I was listening to the current release of Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard and Conrad Thompson. making And this week's episode is about The Rock. And they brought up, at a certain point in that podcast, the episode where Austin took his ball and went home. Vince got on the phone, called in a favor to Dwayne. Dwayne showed up, went off. This is where the Fed had a big problem and still does on occasion by not continuing to build top tier stars. Now, granted, there's only so many slots that you can do in a main event run, but you have to have backup plans. I can't help but remember the the John Cena Roman Reigns promo 
where John Cena called out the fact that he was honored in this phase of his career to have had the United States Championship, whereas Roman looked at it as a demotion. Your secondary championships, if you have them when you have them, must have the same relevance as your primary championship. Yes, for decades, for centuries, the United States Championship has been the stepping stone to the World Heavyweight title. The Intercontinental title has always been called one step below the world title, the WWF title, WWE title. But if you've noticed, those stars that have held that those championships over the year, over the years, over the decades, 99% of them you can see as the primary champion for a company. You can throw all the glass ceiling comments out there you want. Well... Yes. So something something that did get to me is the whole Vince McMahon calling them. You know, they were just trying to succeed a blood of guts. blood and guts. Okay. Right. And it's it's like, well, wait a minute, you, weren't you the one who was paying ECW like to be able to function, um, to well, try and raise up these new stars? Weren't you the one that had I don't know this little thing called the Attitude Era and TLC matches and the ladder match and all right. these things? Right. You blood you, and guts saved his ass. Yes. Yeah. Right. And because, so I get what he's trying to do because now he's not that product anymore. He's trying to say, you know, look how wrong it is. What are the understanding that, you know, somebody who does do that might actually edge them out and become that niche if they do it the right way. And it, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive in my own brain. And people don't make the difference. It's, it's to translate it into independent wrestling think. If there is a venue where there's five different wrestling companies that come out out of it fans don't understand that abc wrestling is different than xyz wrestling when all they know is wrestling is at this building and especially if some of the same talent are on it they don't get it they don't understand they just think it's this big conglomeration of thing called wrestling and so for mainstream fans who now have to relearn that there's this other company that is trying to that is in a way putting on a similar product with a different, slightly different slant, they're going to have to learn it something different. This is not like, you know, WCW, that even before it was WCW had the entire history of the NWA and the way fans came into it before the age of social media. Right. So there was all this, all these years of history on top of the WWE and WWF and WWWF that had all of that history into it. This is something new. Yes, this um, Impact Day 1. Exactly. You mean WCW grade 13. I mean, it, and I, and I tease, I tease a little bit because I want it to be something different. I don't want it to feel like the way things have felt other places. Okay. If their leading argument is we're doing something different. Okay. Here's the problem with, go ahead. Might be real quick to your point, Eddie, I agree on the building and that goes for the announcers too. As much as I like Jim Ross, I can't help but think this is almost like 30 years ago. It is. When a young JR is on the NWA with Gordon Soley, who might have been a little bit past his prime, but we still adored him. I would love to see from day one now, and I don't know who that is, JR is the main voice, but he is grooming the next guy. It reminds me exactly like that, because God forbid if something happens to Jim Ross and they're left without a play by play man. I'll take that job. That side too. <laughs> And to Phil's point, a uh, personal story on this. I show Double or Nothing to some friends of mine and his kids who are the ages between age and tw- uh, 8 and 12. And when it came time for the Cody and Dustin match, that huge blood all over the place that gave me chill bumps and about brought a tear to my eye, the kids had their jaws on the ground. Oh, my God, going ballistic. Because in their short time on this earth, They've never seen pro wrestling like that. So it was just exactly what Phil was saying. There's a whole history of wrestling pre-2010 that existed when stuff like that was pretty commonplace for a big drudge feud. Uh, that, that's just my thing. I think having to retrain people that, you know, maybe under the age of 18 who've never seen wrestling like this unless they watch stuff on the network or on YouTube from that era. One other thing I have to throw out there. And please remember, 
my statements are those of Fast Eddie Lane. I don't expect anybody else on this on this show today or anybody on the network to to agree with me. I understand that we live in 2019. I understand the times in which we live. But there is a D word that drives me batty. Diversity. I understand that there is pressure from different people, different groups, organizations, whatever. You must maintain diversity. Okay. I'm going to say this very clearly. The one thing that will turn off wrestling viewers of ALL all ages is if they feel that an agenda is being rammed down their damn throats other than just trying to find the best people to perform inside the confines of a squared circle. I'm not going to call names because there's a couple of people that have already been signed to AEW, and I'm going to sit back and say, point blank, plain and simple, I don't care if you want to accentuate part of their life away from the ring. They're damn good in-ring talents, and I enjoy watching them work. You want me to mention a name? Fine, I will. Sonny Kiss. Damn good in-ring talent. For anybody and everybody who's been on social media decrying anything about anything else about Sonny Kiss other than the fact that Sonny Kiss is a damn good wrestler, screw you. Plain and simple. But I am the exception, not the rule. Whereas I see Sonny Kiss as a damn good hand and good in-ring talent. Other people out there will look at other facets of Sonny Kiss and go, oh, they only brought Sonny Kiss in because blank. Think it if you want to. That's great and wonderful. I don't care. But quit spreading the poison of stuff like that on social media and trying to infect real wrestling fans with a BS diatribe. Who's banging their head against the phone? Sounded like somebody was banging the phone against something. I'll give you a chance to retort. Fire away. Open floor. Not me, but it sounded like the Blair Witch in the background. Yeah, I know. That's why I thought originally it was Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I took a drink and I legit almost spit it out. <laughs> if AEW signs quality in-ring talent for the right reasons and not the wrong ones beautiful days ahead but a preponderance of pro wrestling fans who are out there across the country if they feel that an agenda is infecting the product they'll turn it off in a heartbeat Wrestling should be wrestling. Let politics be up away from it all and everything else stay away from it too. Because when the bell sounds, all the politics and all the social justice um, insinuations, they don't mean a damn thing. It's how good are you inside the ring when the bell sounds. And in the words of TV's Andy Levy, okay, I'm done. <laughs> Well, that kind of brings me to something that I've only seen just little bits and pieces here and there. I don't know the full story. I just know literally the outline. I guess it kind of brings me to you say signings and everything, and if they're you know if they're if they actually bring something to the product, and you know, there's someone who had a retort and just basically got ripped into by just about everybody. Um. The, the signing of Marco Stunt. Marco Stunt is officially signed. Oh, God. Um, and I don't know if you guys have seen anything about this, but apparently Gunnar Miller? Yeah. Has oh, yeah. something to say? Does anybody want to touch on that? <laughs> Does anybody want to touch oh, on that? Oh, Lord. Uh, let's see. Hello, Pandora. How's your box? 
Oh, okay, I'm stretching on this one. I'm getting ready. I'm warming up. Liver, liver up, big man. Liver up. Okay, Mabo, you go first since you brought this one up. I, do you, how well do you no, know no, this? No, like I said, I, no, what did I just say? All I said was, you know, I, I just got off working a 10-day straight, you know, run at a, at a vet clinic. So, you know, I'm t- not only am I tired, but I'm kind of out of the loop on what happened. So, okay. all I know is. Who wants to go first? Philip, Shane, take your pick. Rock, I paper, scissors, shoot. Since he, no, since Phil, since Phil had to limber up for this, I'll say we let him go first. <laughs> um, sure. I mean, so <laughs> you just you just mentioned diversity, and I, I, I want to be clear on my own personal feeling about this. Diversity is what each individual person brings regardless of – not regardless, but a person's diversity is made up of everything that they're from. Le- their geographic location that they grew up in, their socioeconomic status, their race, their religion, their faith – um, their education, it, it sort of, it's the whole package of the person that they bring to the table. Marco has gar- garnered so much attention so fast. He's getting better. He is uh, comedic in the ring. He is a smaller guy. I'm going to, like, I, and for me, for Gunnar Miller to target Marco as the, you know, I'm this guy that does all these great things. Why am I not being signed? Screw Marco. It's like, what like because he's small okay so you're talking like okay so drake maverick shouldn't be in 205 live are you up or not 205 live in wb are you upset that he's there what about hornswoggle when he was there for 15 years what about aj styles who's five foot five legitimate sorry aj what about <laughs> what about ray mysterio who's also the same height are, are are you saying that because they're shorter that they shouldn't have the opportunities to showcase what they have to be able to show the world the fact that Marco stunts garnered so much attention so fast and for a company that's that's showing we want to put our foot down and go running with the people who have garnered so much attention and that they're not getting um, their opportunities to shine Gunner what noise are you making to make people want to know that you're even still wrestling I mean and this this is not a slam on Gunner this please do not misunderstand me this is a I legitimately thought Gunner had stopped working. I know now he was hurt, and that was part of why he hasn't had a lot of noise and attention. Um, but if I was to do a comparison super quickly, I had neck surgery two years ago, and I've, I'm more aligned with more companies than I was when I was an active competitor, and certainly I'm working more places than, than Gunner Miller. So should I have an opportunity and be upset that Marco Stunt's booked by AEW? It, to me, it was so ridiculous and unneeded. The point, if he was trying to make one, only became why Marco, why, and not me, boo-hoo me, because he is not wrong in the aspect of, like, I'm trying to kill him, I'm trying to do all this stuff in the ring, and, and trying to work out and doing all these great things, that's awesome, so are 1,500 other people. So are 5,000 other people in the United States. I mean, if I go on my Twitter right now. Most of the people who follow me are other people inside of the world of professional wrestling. What makes you stand out as a talent? Right now, if Gunnar Miller was to contact – I mean, I run social media for a couple of the companies I work for. If he was to contact one of the companies that I work for, well, what is so different about him versus the next 4,999 people? What is he doing to make himself stand out? to showcase that he is worth the opportunity to do something different than somebody else who's making a lot of noise. And that's the problem that he didn't, didn't seem to realize or connect to. He's just being upset and bitter right now. And for some reason, Marco was the target of his frustration. Who's yeah, I that? thought a lot of that, I mean, I thought he, I get his sentiment. I read his status three times just to make sure. And the only thing, it does come across bitter and salty, as if, uh, what about me? Why am I not signed? Even though I've been injured, because you know, he put himself over the way he did all the training and the working out, and you know, I, I, I did the right things, and that may be true, but to Phil's point, so do a lot of other guys. I mean, you know, why Marco Stunt is the source of your anger I don't get it. He's certainly not the smallest person to ever be in pro wrestling. Uh, and some people might have said, well, yeah. I mean, I get it. Marco Stunt may look like a short Joey Janela. 
as far as not tremendous cosmetically, whereas Rey Mysterio has a lot of muscle packed onto his small frame. Mm-hmm. But it just didn't seem needed. I mean, it, it, and I know Gunner a little bit having worked around him. I, mean, I get it. The guy's a hardworking dude, but so were a lot of other people. I think what Bill said about that, you know, a lot of people, my goodness, if you read his post, I think it was up in 532 comments as of Thursday afternoon. There were some ruthless pot shots. I mean, this is the internet, but I'm like, from friends of Gunner Bill on there and it just did not come across well for him. I mean a lot I mean I couldn't help but think, what if this is a work and he's going to AEW and the first program is with Marco Stunt. But I digress. Uh, you know, it just it didn't give him a good look. I mean, you know, he's doing the sixty minute Broadway podcast, which is you know, ruffling some feathers around the Georgia Tennessee area and that's fine. He's got a lot of opinions. We all do, we do this program. I just thought I get what he's saying that in his time, pro wrestlers, when he was growing up, looked like Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Ultimate Warrior, all this, and saying that six-year-old me would have laughed at Marco Stunt. And I'm like, maybe 16-year-old you. I don't know about six-year-old you, because I know me at six years old, I didn't have that critical mindset about what I was seeing. Pro wrestling was just pro wrestling, and there was room for a while. In this day and age... Public signings invite public scrutiny. Remember, there was a time in the world of pro wrestling where the general public, the fans, were not privy to, we just find this person. We just release this person. All they knew was new face coming in, old face going out. I'm not saying that that was a perfect time in pro wrestling because everything evolves, hopefully. In some ways I have, in other ways, (laughs) screw you. Darwin wasn't always right about everything. (sighs) To lay out a commentary not knowing the context. We don't know in what genuine capacity Marco Stunt has been hired by AEW and what his contract is going to be given or earned. The knee-jerk reaction is, well, hell, I could have had that spot. Really? Honest and for true? Then I should be hating on everybody on the broadcast team because I feel I should have those spots. When, when when James when, Ellsworth got hired by the WWE, the amount of wrestlers around the country who were so hurt that that Ellsworth had that opportunity, and hell, I don't like Jimmy Ellsworth, and I didn't want him there either. But do you want to be known as the guy who is who looks like he's missing half his chin and doesn't look like he's kind of a wrestler and and is an awkward gentleman, and and you want that spot? Like okay. Like, if that's what you want, go for it. Because you know he's going to be gone in a year and a half. Look what happened. Yeah. Well, and brought back, too. But here's the, here's, here's the context of my comment. Was it public edification when Hornswoggle was genuinely brought in? Did everybody on social media go jumping up and down going, <laughs> No, because it wasn't really public edification. AEW chose to release the information and Marco Stunt chose to release the information which if I'm Marco Stunt I'd be dancing in the streets too Right? hell yeah I got picked up by AEW love you bye but now this is the question that always comes into my mind and this is the part that I didn't say about the broadcast positions at AEW that should be mine I haven't sent the first flipping tape in has Gunnar Miller sent in a tape or two or three? Has he done more? I mean, has he made his presence known to the powers that be in AEW that he would like an opportunity to come work for him? Note, didn't say want a contract, said an opportunity to come work for them. Yes, if my fat ass ever got up and decided to throw a resume Tony Khan's way, if I was given that opportunity, I'd be there with bells on. And yes, I know for a fact that if I were to be brought on by AEW, there would be an outcry of God only knows how many different people. Man, it should have been my spot. Dog spot, liver spot, wet spot. Ask her. So, 
once again, Gunner put himself in an impossible circumstance. However, I do join the sentiment that, yeah, it's going to be funny as hell if it turns out the whole damn thing was a work. There is a difference if you're injured and getting ready to come back and you want to find the fast track to making yourself relevant again, which I'm not saying Gunnar Miller is irrelevant, not in any capacity whatsoever. Know him, love him to death, great kid. Always great to be around. I say kid because I am 28 times his age. I'm older than God. However, (laughs) my pastor will call me tomorrow morning because he listens. But yeah, you just... You have to be careful about how you lay stuff out there on social media because genuine consternation and curiosity can come across as bitchiness very quickly, depending on how you type it and how another person chooses to interpret it. I could, I could in in very loose comparison, I could get on social media in five minutes Man, the sunset is an amazing tint of red and every other color under the sun. Public statement. Fast Study Lane refuses to admit the sky is blue. See what I mean? (laughs) See? Anything can be misconstrued or twisted by anybody. Just depends on how much they want to twist it. Man, there's some beautiful clouds up in the sky today. Public statement. Fast Study Lane decries end of world is near. Sky will be covered and sun will not shine. Really? But we've all seen it happen. We've seen it happen in wrestling. We've seen it happen in entertainment. We've seen it happen in every facet of our lives in 2019 on social media. Yeah. Welcome to the world. Thank you, Kev. Um, yeah, Kevin Rudolph. No. Yeah, it is. Kevin Rudolph. Okay. Welcome to the world. <laughs> Shane, I was expecting you to correct me if I was wrong on that one. <laughs> oh, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Speaking of, and I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot. We're going to do, we're going to do that flip-flop thing to Thursday. We're 16 minutes after the seven o'clock hour in the central time zone, 16 after five on the West coast. Would you just happen to have a question somewhere nearby you from useless trivia? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> let me think. Um, Reason why I ask, for those of us down here in the southeastern U.S., Shane not only is our resident trivia master here on Beyond Ringside Sports Radio, but he also hosts, under the corporate name, Useless Trivia, um, anywhere between three and four times a week. Right? That is correct. Um, wow, I'm trying to think. Okay, um... How about a song title? Sure, go with it. Here's the way. Okay, real quick, before you do, here's the way we play, folks. For those of you that are listening on replay, Shane is going to ask the question, then he's going to ask it a second time, and then the one of us who thinks that they know the answer will say our own respective first name, and then after being acknowledged, then we'll come in with the answer. So you have a chance to think about it for a second, even though you can't really play on um, during the broadcast with us. Sorry about that. All right, go for it. Release. 21 years ago, what song holds the dubious distinction of garnering an Oscar nomination for Best Original Song that year, as well as a Razzie nomination for Worst Song? How many years ago? Song was re- this song was released 21 years ago, so we're talking 1998. It's the only song that has been nominated for a Razzie for Worst Song of the Year and an Oscar for Best Song of the Year. Guys, if you want to take a crack at it, just say your name. Right now we got about 20 people looking at their speakers going, I know this, I know this. Right, <laughs> out right. Of a, out of around 4,500. <laughs> uh, I know, I know this. I know, I know this. I got a hunch. I know it. I just can't put the words in my mouth. Mabel? I'm hearing a song, but I don't know the name of it. Mabel, you want to take a crack at it? Uh, 1998-99. 98-99? Oh. Uh, Nominated uh, for an Oscar for Best Original Song and a Razzie Worst Song. 
1999? 98. 98. 98. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, if you said actress, I would have known exactly this answer, but I can't think of the song name. Um, I'm trying to... Because I was actually listening to music back in the in 98, so... I don't. Oh, um. <clears throat> Hurry, Mark. I, 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 I want to have to. Uh, it kind of goes without saying, but you know, make the connection that it, it must be a song from a film. Yeah, I got you know, that part. Or a Razzie. Yeah, an Academy Award. Just, yeah, I was gonna say I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that they. I was gonna say I didn't know they gave song gave Razzie to songs. Philip, is it um, Celine Dion? My heart will go on. Damn it! That was the that was the most popular guess. That's, that's what I'd have thought. <laughs> okay, that's in, but that's incorrect. Okay, okay. Um, I'm wait, wait, wait. If it's, if it's a movie that got a Razzie, and it was '98, was it that damn song for Batman and Robin? Uh, was it Kiss no. from a, Kiss by a Rose? No, 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 that, no. Uh, that was 96. Yeah. Close. Um, it was a summer blockbuster film in 98. Huge, grossing over $250 million. Go with it. Go and break the answer. The song from Armageddon, I Don't, don't Want to Miss a Thing by ah. Aerosmith. Yeah, I can see easily how that would have got a Razzie, um, Razzie nomination because I just got sick and tired of hearing it every five minutes on every damn top 40 station in my market. Eddie, I do have one more if we want to try it. Go ahead. Same name. Three things, of course, that all have the same answer. It is the last name of a current NFL starting quarterback. It is the fictional setting for a sitcom that debuted over 60 years ago. And it's also the name of a food company that does have a distribution center in Birmingham, Alabama. All has the same name. The last name of a current starting quarterback in the National Football League. The name of a fictional setting of a television sitcom that debuted over 60 years ago. And the name of a food company that has three production plants, one of those being in Birmingham, Alabama. Eddie. Okay. Mayfield. You are correct. Mayfield was the fictional setting from Leave It to Beaver. Thank you. <laughs> Stop hitting. Eddie, Eddie is old. Ageism. <laughs> Uncle Charlie! I was actually just talking about My Three Sons and some of those other shows from that era in um, everything from Leave It to Beaver to, oh, God. <laughs> the other day, that's why I screamed out Uncle Charlie. I know you said leave it to be, but still. Um, got the hat trick? Got one more quick one? Uh, let's see. Um, and did you have a chance to do any research on the question that was put to you last night by J- um, um, at the show? Did not. I'll throw Although this. Although I do think it would be Idaho or Montana. True. Well, I don't know. Ted Guinness is still out in Idaho. I'm sure he can find one of those towns. Population one. Ted. <laughs> <laughs> and which normally Mabo would follow up with, well, that means the town is deserted. Hey, they're right, Mabo. Sure. You said question that. Mark? <laughs> yes, we always question Mark. I don't know what's going on. I just, we're talking about Big Idaho. Big question, Mark. I like this. <laughs> Gotta love the inside jokes. Uh, um, I guess I could do, I want to pull this up in my notes on my phone. I do have it. Okay. Um, this is, we could do a music one here, the old list bonus. Now we've got three people instead of two. There you go. Um, the Beatles. And Led Zeppelin are the top two best-selling bands of all time. This is combined with uh, physical sales and digital sales. The Beatles and Led Zeppelin are one and two. 
and this would have been like for one point apiece, name the 10 other bands, groups, however you wish to define it, that have sold at least um, 120 million copies combined, physically and digitally. Eddie. You want to, okay, so we'll do the uh, go until you're incorrect. We have the Beatles, we have Led Zeppelin. Who else? There's 12 bands total that have 120 million combined sales. Uh, I would like to start and go with one of the most enduring names in country music, Garth Brooks. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, bands Band. or I was going to say, you're uh, saying uh, bands. He yeah. said band, Eddie. Uh, that does include a band. He has All one right, of those so when he's so on Eddie's stage. So Eddie's lost. Uh, next on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Eddie lost. So next person, Phil, go ahead. Phil, go ahead. Metallica. Nope. Correct. Metallica um, is one of them? Metallica is correct. That sucks. Remember, like, during the whole age of Nets, or not Netscape. Uh, Napster. What was it? Um, Nap- Napster. They Napster. were like, we're too big. Um, we don't want our... our, our Sales to plummet for people pirating. Um, hmm. You too. Should be correct. Um, the Jackson Five. No. Incorrect. Uh, Bill has two. I'll go over to Mabo. Uh, Guns and Roses. Incorrect. For the Eddie. Uh, let's see. Groups. Bands. All right, then. With 120 million total sold or higher, the cutoff is down to 120 million. We have the Beatles and Led Zeppelin. I gave you. Phil has got Metallica and you two. I'm going to go just for fun. I'm going to sit back and say the Beach Boys. Incorrect, believe it or not. Phil, um... Queen. Should be there. Yes. Three. Uh, bands, bands. Um, we've already said them. We've already said them. Um, oh, um, um, Florida Georgia Line. <laughs> <laughs> Incorrect. You should see the look Maybo. on my face as I said it. Maybo? Um, I can't believe nobody said it yet, but what about the Stones? Correct. Rolling Stones. Oh, shoot. I got to click in? Yeah. Yes, you do. Fills ahead three to one. Um, Fans, 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 fans. I'm going to say, let's go with, it probably won't, but in sync. Damn it. Incorrect, but you know I had a lot of guesses of NSYNC and Backstreet. Um, personally, I'm going to go with America's Gold Record Champions, Kiss. Incorrect. Damn it! Whoa. This will be your three strikes and you're out. Phil's got a three-one-zero lead. Um, I oh god, I hate myself because I had just had something in my brain and it went away. Um. Shoot, what was I just thinking of? Um, I keep going back to individual artists. Shoot. Um, yeah, no, that was my flaw to kick things off. I, no, that's a single person. Um, so is Prince. Okay, if 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 in sync isn't there, I'm gonna say the. The Backstreet Boys? He already answered that one. Oh, he did? All right. Yeah, yeah he already answered that. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, we'll give you one. We'll give you a mulligan. Oh. Boo. <laughs> I didn't get one on Garth. Uh, Chicago. I'm going to go complain on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Incorrect on Chicago. Okay. Uh, um... Black Sabbath? Incorrect, Eddie. Okay, Black Sabbath is a no. I'm making notes as we go. I was gonna I was wondering if you were jotting these things. Uh missed the one that Philip just missed. 
Philip, what'd you just say? He said uh, back to Chicago. Yes, oh, Chicago. Chicago. I said both of them, so yeah. I would like to say, actually, my second favorite band of all time, Pink Floyd. Hmm? You are correct. There you go. Holy crap, I'm on the board. Pink Floyd is actually, Pink Floyd is actually uh, uh, like fourth all time. Um, well, let's see. We've mentioned Zeppelin. There's so two- out of a top 12, I gave you the Beatles and Zeppelin. Right. Bill has given us Queen, U2, Metallica, um, uh, let's, and Pink whoa, Floyd whoa, whoa. and the Rolling Stones. Okay. One of my... I'm tied between one, and believe me, even though I don't want to miss another thing, I'm not going to say Aerosmith this time. I'm going to say ACDC. Let me just be nice and give you for your Garth Brooks mulligan. ACDC is correct, and Aerosmith is correct. <laughs> Wait, no, you can't do that. <laughs> no. Throughout the history of this program, all, Eddie always does that. He's like, I'm not going to say Aerosmith. And it's like, well, if I did, it'd be on there. Right. I'm like, you've already name dropped. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, if I if you just said ACDC was, I was gonna say uh, if I'd have gotten that one, I'd have said Aerosmith anyway. Should have written down what everyone said so far. Uh, let's see. Mabo has struck out with Guns and Roses, In Sync, and Black Sabbath. He's gotten uh, the Rolling Stones correct. Phil, you have gotten Metallica, U2, and Queen. You have whiffed on the Jacksons, Florida, Georgia Line, and Chicago. Um, I have whiffed on the Beach Boys and Kiss. I've gotten Pink Floyd, ACDC, and Aerosmith. Okay. And also, well, also whiffed on Garth Brooks to start out the damn series. Yeah. Um, I'm going, that leaves us with three. I'm going to stick in the classic rock vein. Um, the Eagles. Damn it! Correct. Damn it! <laughs> what were you the thinking Eagles that? Are on there. I totally was. Does that tie you and Phil up? Uh, I just passed him four to three. Oh, you've got two more. Um, this is where it gets tricky. Mm, mm. I have one, but it's probably wrong, which means it's probably right. Okay, so it could I'm be right. This, well, I'm hold on. Throw this out here because a lot of teams said this. It's not in the country genre. Alabama is not on this. Okay. Oh, I have a joke I'm going to well, play that's a, that's a damn shame right there. <laughs> Actually, I would have thought Alabama would have been on that list. That would have been close. Um, thank you for... They're close. Though. They're like 85 to 90 minutes. Yeah. Well, if you change your mind, I... I'm the next in line. Because, honey, I'm still free. Take a chance on me. I'm going to go ABBA. Oh, I was going to say ABBA. See, crap. ABBA is on this list, and what? one of my was, nine teams playing Tuesday said ABBA. How? I was going to say ABBA, too. Like, I was seriously, because Dancing Queen was playing in my head for some reason. I and I was get, like, I'll get it. Wow. Um, I can give you exact reasons, because remember, you had ABBA, then you had ABBA teens. Now you have Mamma Mia and so many other ABBA tributes that are out there. It just actually hit me a second ago. It's like, well, wait a minute. How many people have done ripoffs of ACDC? And let's go ahead and go with how Because the only reason why I started thinking ACDC was because I was having a Tony Stark moment shoot to thrill hit my head. I was well, just playing so funny. Playing in my head, so. I gave you number one and number two, the Beatles and Led Zeppelin. In no particular order, we have went three through 11 with the Eagles, the Rolling Stones, Queen, Metallica, uh, ABBA, U2, Aerosmith. We are down to the 12th and final group slash band that has had 120 million units, both physically and digitally combined. Okay. Um, I've got two. I'm not sure. I'm going to say Genesis. That is incorrect. That is very popular. I should have. I can looked. also throw out um, no poison, no Def Leppard, no Bon Jovi. Ooh, bon, that no was Motley a, Crue, bon, no Quiet Riot. Damn. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think I got one. Take it. Okay. Journey. No journey. Oh, oh damn. I know. Maybe. All right. I might 
I might have it. Like I said, I've got two, but I'm going to go with the first one that popped into my head. Go with it. Uh, I'm going to say Grateful Dead. Ooh, good idea. Wow, that's a good guess. But it is incorrect. Ooh. Ooh. So, Mabo, Mabo said the dead. I want to ask a clarifying question, but I, I almost want to wait until after Eddie's turn. <laughs> <laughs> Ask it, I dare you. <laughs> well, now keep in mind we're also at a disadvantage because Eddie, Eddie is a like a DJ and he's around music all the time. Yeah. So we should all get a point and a half. <laughs> <laughs> our point should double. Our, our point should be doubled, and nothing else should matter. Okay, so let's see. All points should double. So therefore, you just went with the AEW reference. Um, then you also went, because nothing else matters, you went for the Metallica reference. I'm going to say... Just pick a dadgum song. Either what? Oh, pick a Someone song? has other things to do. Pick a song? Okay. <laughs> pick, your, pick, pick, pick your group. Pick your group so we can move on. Pick a, pick a group? No Good matter... Lord. I'm staying alive. You going with the Bee Gees? I'm going with the Bee Gees. Eddie Lane just closed this list out. Damn the it. Bee Gees. Mm. Where did Skinner sit? Ooh, good question. Uh, they there's a lot of them in that like Leonard Skinner, Credence Clearwater Revival, Three Dog Journey, Night, Alabama, Def Leppard. They're all in that like seventy million to ninety five million. Ah, uh, okay. So that's your top twelve top twelve selling bands groups of all time, and also like say REM, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Ario Speedwagon, and Dave Matthews Band, all in that little. I was just like about to say, to I was going to say Chili Peppers. My my question was going to be like, is this a trick where, you know, like Dave Matthews band because it's a person, but it's a band. Right. Mm -hmm. They are considered a, a band group. Yeah. Right. It is considered a band. Yes. Unlike Garth Brooks, who's the leader of the organization, but the band doesn't count. <laughs> Butt munchers. <laughs> the band doesn't. <laughs> well, remember, he did have a very successful run in Las Vegas on the residency at the Win, which I really wanted to see other than on CBS. I wanted to be there live, just never made it out there. Tell you what, we're going to go ahead and sit back and say it is, according to my funky little clock, um, 19 minutes before the top of the 8 o'clock hour of the Central Time Zone. Um, Six o'clock is on the horizon for those of you on the West Coast. Uh, let's go ahead and start the run for the radio ranch, if you will. And I'm going to go ahead and sit back and say a couple of quick ones. Number one, um, thank you to everybody who made it out to the Peach State Wrestling Alliance live event in Villarica, Georgia last night. Had a great crowd start to finish. Absolutely awesome. Had some great action. Um, and I know, Shane, uh, you're probably going to do the shameless plug for Saturday, that, September the 7th, which, of course, I just took right out from underneath you, even though um, – we're definitely going to be covering a lot more of that in the weeks to come, especially the um, tag team street fight that you were in the middle of. Sure, we can do that at a later date if you like. I, mean, I figured you'd go ahead and mention at least everybody who's in it. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, uh, myself and Ace Haven versus the Southern Mafia of Johnny Rage and Greg Dawson. See, I'm out of touch. I've been out of practice uh, in a street fight at the BFW Fairgrounds in Carrollton, Georgia, 8 o'clock Eastern Time. At 1625 Bankhead Highway, Carrollton, Georgia, Saturday, September 7th. Uh, also on that one, already signed the son of former WWE star Bull Buchanan, Ben Buchanan, all of 17 years old, to take on marvelous Marco Wicker. Uh, boy, this one's been brewing for about two months now. And we've also got the grand design, Clyde Braddock, uh, will be in action against Brian Blaze, managed by none other than Matt Hankins and... The PWA Heritage Champion, the Revelation Shane Marks. It's going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. Um, Philip, where were you hiding last night? I know you were on the road. Um, I had a last-minute fill-in, so I was at Showtime Championship Wrestling Alliance in Wheeling, West Virginia. Very nice. How was everything? Um, it was my first time there. Brand new event, so you know that's always interesting to, just to see how another event runs um, that I'd never worked with before. Um, I am hopefully going to go back. Very cool, very cool. And, Mabel, we're going to get you out and about in the very near future because I know that you're uh, reestablishing plans with a couple of different groups. Looking forward to hearing that as time gets closer. So I'm going to go ahead and say, gentlemen, let's take it around the horn one time without getting sued by ESPN for me saying that phrase. And Mark Mabel Bowman, last call. 
Uh, uh, good. I don't know. Uh, I will say though to kind of touch on what what Shane said, talking about uh, young Benjamin Buchanan. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of working with Ben when he really kind of first started out uh, at the former Southern Legacy Wrestling, now Victory Championship Wrestling. You know, kid started out as a referee. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get to the, the venue multiple times early. I got you know see him train. You know, get this, you know sit next to his father and just watch his father. You know, Bull Buchanan just impart wisdom. And say, you know, hey, no, you know, do this, do this position, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, just looking at Ben, I'm like, that, the first day I saw him, I found out that was Bull's kid, I was like, I was like, this kid, even not, even if I didn't know who his father was, I was like, this kid's going to be somebody if he stays on the right track and he's, you know, given the proper education. I mean, you know, he's he's definitely something. Is, that not, one of, is that not one of the biggest 17-year-olds you've ever seen? Yeah, bro. I, I mean, I hate to go Vince Russo with the bro, bro. But I, I walked in and I'm thinking, you know, he's early twenties, and you know, I'm just sitting there talking to the kid. I didn't even ask his age. He's like, you know, he's like, yeah, I had a game last night, blah blah blah, talking about football. And I was like, oh, what, you know, you go to college? What college? He's like, no, it's still high school. And I was just like, what? what? <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, you're a big feller, so. But yeah, and he's such he's such a sweet kid, you know. Not to not to pull back the curtain too much, but he's such a sweet kid, like you know, such a respectful young man too. That's the thing is, you know, to, to steal Eddie's phrase, you know, he didn't know me from Adam when I first met him, but you know, he knew that you know I was commentary for the company, and you know, he was you know very much like anything I asked him was like yes sir, no sir. That that just came from you know I guess that's just proper upbringing. A lot of kids these days need. Uh, from his father and everything, so you know to to see him that he's actually moving even further in his career, uh, because I have been away from you know victory championship wrestling for a while. Uh, that's just amazing. So you know that's a that's a good find for for any company. So you know that's just my my little little thing there. So yeah, I will say Phil Stamper last call. Um, excited to see just what happens in the future. I'm looking for some more opportunities myself. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow all of my craziness online at PS Phenom on Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube, and Snapchat. Oh, wait, we're doing shameless plugs too. Yeah, we are. Do you? I just went ahead to it. I just jumped. Oh, I just thought it was last call. Well, that t- you can do shameless plugs in last call. We've done it. You normally do it. <laughs> God knows, Wick used to. Wow. I thought you usually broke it up. Well, I mean, I hate to jump back in front of Shane, but I just want to throw some stuff out there real quick. Go for it. Make it quick. Um, you can catch quick. Mabo at ShaneKnowles at gmail.com. <laughs> yes, but only when, I, only when I send him the nudes. Bro, you gotta give me you got to give me some time to, to re-energize. You gotta, can't just be sending them like that all the time. So, But uh, VCWAction.com, hopefully I will be back with them soon. I do have some upcoming dates for New Level Pro. Really? I'll, uh, yeah, Shane, I <laughs> just heard you. <laughs> but, um, that was Eddie that we'll said, really? Fight for that one, Mabo, I gotta say. Well, we'll talk about that off air. But VCWAction.com, they just opened the Victory Academy. Uh, find out if you wanna, you know, if you're in the Alabama area and you wanna find a, a reputable place to train, go somewhere else. But if you want to train with VCW Action, you know, VCW, they go to VCWAction.com and they're on YouTube and the Facebooks and all that stuff. Shane Knowles. Back to Shane. Uh, school is starting back, and it's soon to be my favorite time of the year as fall will be upon us. Weather gets cooler, good food, good travel. The holidays will soon be here, football season. But going back to wrestling, uh, that also means, you know, fall television is back. Your favorite sitcoms and dramas, and starting on Wednesday, October 2nd, weekly pro wrestling on TNT and <laughs> It just cracks me up a little bit that Chris Jericho was on the last national product on TNT, uh, like in 96, 97. He will be back again. Um, I root for the best for AEW. I know that dominated a lot of the conversation tonight, but I want them to succeed. I look forward to getting into a routine of watching weekly wrestling that isn't WWE-oriented. 
that I can do both if I should, should so choose. And I think that's all we can hope for. I think if you're a pro wrestling fan in 2019, you have more avenues, more ways to get content than ever. I mean, in the mid-'80s, we had Joe Pettisino and Bonnie Blackstone doing the superstars of wrestling where tapes were sent in every week for every territory and promotion. That was one thing. Channel 69. Powerbomb TV, Pipe TV, Fleet Report, YouTube, any number of different places you can watch pro wrestling if you're not satisfied with the current one that you were viewing. So as for myself, Shane Knowles uh, at gmail.com. You can find me on Snapchat, Instagram, uh, and Facebook. Be Shane Wrestling Alliance, uh, September 7th, back in uh, Northern Georgia, September the 29th, excuse me, the 28th, Pro Wrestling Circuit in Thomason, Georgia. Uh, Pro Wrestling Circuit had a really good debut um, Saturday, July the 27th. I'm fortunate to be on that show. Um, it's really good talent. AJ Steele, Stony Hooker, some guys that have not been seen over the last couple of years, debuted on Pro Wrestling Circuit. Uh, they drew a good crowd right at about 300 for an inaugural event at the uh, Thomas Civic Center. It's a beautiful thing here, so check out Pro Wrestling Circuit as well on social media. At Beyond Ringside on Twitter, Facebook.com slash Beyond Ringside Live. You can also find, well, it's actually, it's Facebook.com slash Beyond Ringside as well as Facebook.com slash Beyond Ringside Live. Pro Wrestling Radio.net is home. Beyond Ringside.com is home for everybody catching us on replay all the way through up, the, up and down the spectrum. You can find Beyond Ringside Sports Radio or Beyond Ringside uh, through iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker. Stitcher, so many different ways. I lost count. I swear. Um, I'm very gracious. I'm very graciously appreciative of the fact that we are being featured on both Spotify, Apple Podcasts, both. Okay, so I'll leave it at two. Um, Spotify and iHeartRadio. Greatly appreciative and very humbled by those. Um, we are going to work to get everything back into the traditional groove. Um, since summer is starting to be a little bit less volatile here in my home market, which means the sauna will not be adversely affecting me that much by me walking in the door to a 102 degree house. So if you know somebody in central Alabama who is reasonable on air conditioner repair, drop me a line. Facebook.com slash Fast Eddie Lane. Also, for my friends in the home market, remember Friday nights, 9 o'clock, Buffalo Wild Wings in Alabaster. The party continues Friday night karaoke. I want to say congratulations to Connor to pick it, um, for picking up the $25 Buffalo Wild Wings gift card this past Friday night in the Just for Fun Karaoke Challenge. Remember, the Just for Fun Challenge is every Friday night, 10 o'clock p.m. Karaoke starts at 9. The challenge starts at 10. It's not a contest. It's a raffle. You sing, you get ticket. 11 o'clock. Tickets get drawn. If your ticket is the one, um, ticket matches the one that I draw, you win. It's that easy. So just come out, have fun. It's that damn simple, folks. Thank you for hanging with us. We hope you enjoyed the ride. We will be back very soon. The Sunday editions return soon. The Thursday editions return soon. We're gonna get it all back together and do it one more time, and then some. For Mark Mabo Bowman, make that thing clap. Make it slap. Talk to me now. Thank you, Buster Rhymes. <laughs> For the Phenom Phil Stamper. Onomatopoeia. For Shane Knowles. Now I've got an onomatopoeia pull off the side of the This is Fast Study Lane saying, y'all really shouldn't have said that because I just got through with some jalapeno roast beef poppers from Arby's and they are deciding to play with my stomach. Until next time, adios, uh, das vidanya, hasta luego, off leaders, ain't child, sayonara, adu, adivadeche, farewell, abyssinia, au revoir. And until we meet again, aloha, mis bye bye. Join us right here next time as we all go beyond ringside. Bye for now.